Hey guys, welcome back. We're in Papakura and we're going to meet up with DJ Sevilla and check out some more Lost Nightclubs of Auckland City. Here's the man himself. Hey. <laughs> What's up, bro? How are you? You good, man? Good to see you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Papakura of all places, eh? Yeah. So, I mean, I'm from Hamilton. Yeah. I represent Kirikirua pretty hard, but mm. I grew up in Papakura, which is where we are. Okay, this just looks like an old little tavern or something. This is uh, the Forge. Okay. So the Forge is the first nightclub I ever set foot in. Ever. Wow. Ever. Yeah. Um, so I used to live just down the road here. Yeah. So yeah, my sister, she's a club rat. Like mm. Hard out. And then... Was she older than you? Yeah, she's a, she's a few years older than me. Okay. But she was like, her nightclub experiences was way ahead of me. But she was like, you're coming with me. And I was like... This is, this is the moment, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then, because Louise knew all the bounces and everything, so I rocked up without an ID, look, and I was clearly 16. Yeah. And they were just like, oh, where you go? <laughs> <laughs> the entrance used to be just around this side, actually, okay. just have a look. Yeah. So it's still, it's the Forge, right? It's so Forge, see, see it's Forge 2. Okay, see Forge right 2. Oh, yeah, this is yeah. like, this is part 2. Yeah, so the entrance used to be over here. Yeah. Now, the real awesome, interesting fact about this joint is that General Lee's parents own this place. The big VS screen at the far end, DJ box on the right, bar, uh, bar at this end, and it, ha it has a stage Okay. right along the left side. And the, the night that I went, mm. Artie Joe were playing. Oh, wow. That's a high caliber artist. Well, so, back, back yeah. then, I don't know if Artie Joe were quite Artie Joe oh, yet. Okay. I'm not sure. They would have been harmonizing away beautifully, right? So. It, it, was, <laughs> it, was, it was like really packed. Yeah. It was really exciting. It was my first experience. And I do remember because the DJ box is on this side. Because my dad's a DJ. There's a, quite a bit of a backstory here. Yeah. So by the time I got here, you know, I was already fascinated with DJing in general. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I believe that the first ever record I played in a nightclub situation was here. Wow. What did I, it feel like? Like, I was very nervous. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't remember much about <laughs> it. I think because the guy who DJ here knew I because I'd bring down records. Yeah. And he'd be like, why are you bring? What? <laughs> You bring your records down here. <laughs> and I just show them to him. It's like, He's like, I'm ready to play, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I remember one night he finally was like, oh, play a record. So I, I played it. I, I remember playing it. What song was it? It was You To Me Are Everything But the, the Real Thing. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And um, yeah, I played it and no one liked it. <laughs> and then he gave it back to me. I was like, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> no, but it was cool, though. It was yeah. cool, you know. Everything that happened afterwards... As far as not not necessarily with DJing, but just like yeah. being in that environment, is this is the spot. And what what was the scene like down here? Like, who would go to this place? Everybody. Yeah, right. But the music policy was all over the place. They played heaps of rock and roll, heaps of pop, a little bit of R and B. They used to play this um, this Motown rock and roll mega mix. Oh, they cool. used to go on for like ten minutes. I like the sound of that though. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of and, sounds and, fun. And, right? and on the big screen, they had a yep. video playing of cars crashing into each other <laughs> this is like early burger feel you know where they have like yes. just just memes and things going you know the dj would like just literally push the button and walk off oh, yeah. and have a break you yeah. know what i mean <laughs> um and i remember hating that music okay but for some reason it still resonates today so and what what do you think you most learned here like just 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 the, the basics really just the basics like yeah. just being smart you know yeah like, yeah but well, then also forming like social groups outside of your social groups. Right. That was quite a big deal. Well, that's another thing for a DJ, because you've got different kinds of DJs. You've got DJs that are quite quiet and reserved, and they come up and they play a really cool set, but then they, they don't interact with people much. Yeah. And then you've got the other kind of DJ that are actually really resonating with the people, and they're, they're, they're a community figure as well. Um, that's why I think you're a bit more along those lines, right? I guess or, I just been around a that's long who time. You are. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I think I also think that I I get quite frustrated with the heads down DJ. Yeah, yeah. Because like if, if if you're not enjoying it then I don't know if anyone's gonna quite enjoy it. Yeah, yeah. So I mean each to their own, they're all different and stuff. But, it is um, different, yeah yeah, 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 yeah. I just think that the community is quite important. Yeah. So if you separate yourself from the community, I don't know quite how that works in a long term. It's a bit different now because I don't have residency really. Yeah, yeah. So I'm always travelling around, so as a result I've kind of, I kind of got friends everywhere. Yeah. So that's cool. But if you have a residency, it's important to, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. put your arms around your people, man. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that was definitely what was happening here. But it's proper cool, man. Like, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So, I mean, like the back door was here. Uh, oh, no, the, the front door was here. Oh, sorry, front door. Front. Was there any fights or anything in here? Was it dodgy? Or yeah, was there, there was, yeah. yeah there, okay. there was actually some, I remember there was some plants here. There's a planters here. And a few people ended up being thrown into the planters. <laughs> it, it was, you know what? It, because back then there was heaps of gang activity in the city. Okay. Most of them kind of didn't come here. Okay. Yeah, because you don't know what you're going to get when you come out of Auckland. You go to like a, a bar or a tavern. Uh, you can be in the suburbs and there's a place there and it's got like like a thousand people in there uh -huh. and some covers band it's going crazy it's like a night a huge rock concert within a tavern um and then other times you might be out there and yeah it's like you're out in the wop wops and there's a and there's a few locals and you get that look when you walk in the bar like you're a foreigner um, you know you know what's interesting though is that but people always talk about oh south auckland yeah but i'm from south auckland yes. so it's different from it's like an insular thing you look people go Oh my God! Used to go out and blah blah blah. I was like, "Of course I did. This is where I live." Yeah, yeah, so yeah. So it's kind of funny when people talk to me about that post now, because yep. I realise that I was probably in lots of really hairy situations, but I did not because I lived there. That was just different. normal. It's different, man. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so yeah, there probably was quite a heavy element of danger, but I never felt it. No, because I'm normal. from here, man. Like, yeah, you know, half of the mobsters here or the black power guys, I knew most of you them. Knew so them. whatever. It just is what it is, you know. How does Papakura sit within, sort of, compare it to, say, Otara or Mangari? Or is it, what's the buzz out here? Is it a bit more farmy kind of vibes out here? Well, it, this, so when they talk about, you know, I'm from the end of the tracks. Yeah. This is literally the end, end of, the, of tracks. the tracks. So if we go, like, about 300 metres that way, yeah. there was this turnstile that the trains used to turn around on because the trains run into town and back. Yeah. But... They had this turn, manual turnstile they'd turn the train around on. Right. No shit, it's just over there. <laughs> what, so, what, people get out and push the train yes. around? Holy shit. This is when I was a little kid. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, yeah. But literally, they would turn it on a turnstile. Wow, that's because amazing. the train had to go back that way. Yeah. It sounds preposterous, yeah. but Google it. As far as here, yeah, you're right. Mm. Because a couple of k's down the road, the farmland starts. Right, right. And then it turns into Drury, which is where I went to primary school, which is another 5 k's out. Yeah. So that is literally the, the city limits. Yeah. So with regard to moving into town, what you would find was that there's heaps more Polynesians mm. the, the closer you got to town. Yep. And then there's a certain cap when you got into town where it disappeared and it became yeah, a bit, right. bit more bougie and stuff, you know? Yeah. There's a couple other spots. There's one around the corner, but the forge was where everyone went, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was, because it was when my sister first took me, yeah. this became it, this is it. The, the interesting part about living out here was that everything was in town. Yes. Like, I know there, there's definitely clubs we could talk about in, mm. in, in like, Mangere, town centre, but everyone wanted to go to town. Yeah. When people would talk about going to town, so that's why it's we're going to... 40 minutes on the train, right? So. Well, it was actually an hour and 20 on a bus. Right. And the, no one caught the train. Yeah, yeah. The train was not, you just didn't catch the train. Uh, Steam and the, engine. Uh, and the train stopped early as well. Yeah, and yeah. didn't start till, yeah, no one caught the train. Okay. Everyone was catching buses. Yeah. And the last bus out of town was midnight. So if you stayed in town, if you went out, you had to stay in town. So we would go out till three in the morning, four in the morning, and then had to sit at the bus stop for two hours. Wait for the first bus. Wait for bus. the first bus. Wow. Or we were lucky enough to have one of the boys who had a car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which was, like, there was a couple of guys who had cars. But that's kind of why there's this, as far as the rest of mm. like suburban Auckland, mm. everything else sort of ends up in town. Yes. We talked to Manuel, we always ended up in town because town was where it was at. Right, right. That's where all the records were, that's where all the DJs with the records, Simon, Roger, all those guys mm. had the records. So there's a bit of a jump from me being a local here. Yeah. By the way, you couldn't get the records. Yeah. That's the separation between being a suburban kid mm. who had very little money to going into the city which had record stores which had all the records but you didn't have the money to buy them yeah. versus the DJs that did have the money in the city. Yeah. So it's kind of like there was quite a high a, a very wide gap between mm. us having a few records DJing in our houses, which is what we did, yeah. to, to working in a club in town. That's a big jump, man. And those few records you had had to be weapons, right? Like <laughs> And you know, you and if you made a mistake and bought the wrong one, <laughs> yeah, 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 put yeah. you back months, bro. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they're all there's local legends, of course, everywhere you go. You know, mm. there's everywhere I go in, in South Auckland, you know, Classic Daddy in Monaco, or there's all these really awesome local legends. But you know, for people from my generation, my DJ group, it was always about the city. All right, well, let's um, let's head towards the city. Um, 
and maybe we'll make a stop on the way, eh? Little yeah, there's one, there's one place which is pretty infamous okay. and uh, quite, a good fun, quite, quite a good story too, you know? Okay. Okay, we're not quite at the city yet, but we're, we're over halfway. Getting there. And um, we've, uh, we've just stumbled across what is, what is um, Dominion Road. Right? Yeah, this is the top end of Dominion Road. It turns into Dominion Road extension up there. But yeah, um, this is Matt Roskill. The, a part of, the, of my evolution too was I moved from Papakura to Onihanga. Mm. And Onihanga to Matt Roskill too. So as these neighbourhoods become more familiar to me as I got a bit older... So this place, this spot here is pretty famous. This, this um, early education centre here, it used to be United Video yes. back in the day. Met lots of cool friends through this particular place. Mm -hmm. But anyway, upstairs at this place um, is Manhattan. Hi there. Are you guys, um, are you guys uh, got access to the Manhattan venue? Oh, okay. Oh, we're doing a historic <laughs> tour of um, nightclub, old nightclub venues in Auckland. Yeah. Um, and this used to be uh, a nightclub. Area, yeah. Yeah, go on. Oh, cool. Awesome. Stop Thank in. you so much. <laughs> yeah. Wow, okay. So this was the front door? I don't remember me. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. This is it. This is the Manhattan Club. I wonder if these are the original tables. I don't think so. <laughs> the tables were from memory were smaller. Okay. Now, plus what? I, I thought it was tiered. Okay. I think it had like a, a t oh, I can't remember. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to remember, man, it's crazy being in this room. But though. you did go here a few times, so. Okay, this, this nightclub um, had a, a novelty to it. What was that? This, 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 this club was special. And, you know, it's, it's, it's almost gotten to urban myth uh, uh, level where each of the tables had a phone on it so so if you if you wanted to not like what we would do is we, yeah. me and my friends would be idiots and just ring each other and just talk shit yeah yeah but the real the real method the, the real reason for it more than anything was to you know if you didn't have any game yeah which most of us didn't um it just it was an instant like you know wow i could just pick up you know, like some, you know, when people say, oh, you know, you got no business talking to that girl. Yeah. Um, this was the ultimate, like, a, you know, it's like a shield. So you would just literally pick up the phone and go, yo, what up? What? And they'll be look, looking around like, what? So you could choose a table, see someone you like over there, pick up the phone, talk to them. Yep. And with multiple phones on all the tables, that was a great way to connect, right? I was looking at some forums and there were some people that were like, oh, yeah, my parents met at this nightclub. Wow. So this was like the early Tinder, right? <laughs> in, one, in one room. Yeah, but you just cross the other side of the room, yeah, yeah. Which is crazy. Do you remember the kind of music they might have played here? Kind of didn't matter. Yeah. It, it wasn't really about the music yet yes. for us. No, right. Yeah. Um, the music, the music kind of... It's more about the scene. It was more about the scene and it was, yep. and it was more, it was like what they call an open format now. Because mm. they basically didn't play anything. Yep. So the fours they were playing rock and roll pop, you know, dance music. Well, what was dance music? Getting into the city clubs was hard. Mm. You couldn't just like not, it's very competitive now, mm. but back then you had to figure out how to get through the door. Mm. Like as you moved away into town, this is like a little bit, little bit of a testing ground to yeah. see. It wasn't so hard to get in here. But. Well, little cool facts. Um, so there probably would have been a stage, right, somewhere? I think it was against the wall, maybe. I can't okay. Remember. It's name dropping. Uh, Billy T. James performed here. Um, not sure if whether it was a, co a comedy or, or he was singing, because he did sing, right? Yeah. Uh, mention in the comments if you did if you were here and witnessed that. And another character that's been here is um, Russ LaRock, or commonly known as Russell Crowe. Yes, the actor. Um, was what was all, the band? What was that? Uh, his band was the Roman Addicts. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And um, we're going to talk a little bit more about him later, but he did play one of his first gigs here. It may have actually been his first gig right here in the Manhattan, and it still stands here today with its high ceiling, um, tables... And it's more like a function venue now. So it's yeah. tough to envision it too because it's so different now. Like uh, this, this venue has clearly changed many times. Those are not the tables, I'm sure of it. <laughs> <laughs> but can you imagine being in a nightclub and just having phones on all the tables? It's idea. so cool. I wonder if someone could bring it back, you know, see if it make it work these days. I mean, you'd have to leave your phone at the door, <laughs> yeah. you know? You know what? Some people wouldn't know how to use a phone with a dial on it, I don't yeah. think. <laughs> 
Shazam, we're in the city. <laughs> Bang! <laughs> and um, we're on Nelson Street. Yes, we are, right in the inner city, uh, before it drops off to go down the viaduct down there. I'm pretty excited about this particular spot. I have to admit to you, I'm, just being here, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, real happy to be here. Right? So this is a good one. Now, I think this is the same venue that um, I used to go to as well, but let's hear it from you first. Let's, let's go have a look. It's over here. Sure. It's a bit weird now because with the inner city, things disappear, huh? Yeah. Um, but this is, this is definitely one of the, if not the greatest nightclub for me personally. Wow. In the uh, in inner city Auckland. It's, uh, the building's gone. Wow. It used to be a restaurant on the top level here. The entrance to the club was over to the left. It later morphed into something else, but those are the stairwell There's the stairs. to go down the other side. But the one, the, the, the door that we had to try and uh, navigate our way through was just over here. Right, right. So this is the site of a club that was called The Brat, which was, I believe, was run by Peter Ehrlich and Simon. Uh, no, sorry, Peter Ehrlich and Mark Phillips okay. first, and it was called The Brat. Right. The Brat was like, yeah, I didn't really, really go to The Brat, because once again, it was always about negotiating doors. This is the... This is always the hard bit. It's, I don't think it's a race thing, but brown kids from South Auckland would always find it difficult to get into the doors in town. Now, it wasn't really a racial base thing, but quite often the big part of it was that all the bouncers knew us because uh, they're all from South Auckland. Right. So when you turn up, they're like, I know you're not the right age because <laughs> I went to school with you, bro. Yeah. Or, no, you know, I, you're, my younger brother is, your, is in your class. Right. So I remember Manuel talking to me about this quite a bit. He's like, it was, you know, you get to the door and you'd be like, oh man, there's no way I'm getting in. Plus, we come all the way into the city and then could have get into the oh, nightclub. Get denied. It's... Anyway, the, the brat turned into the playground. And the playground is the one that I really wanted to talk about. Yes. Because the playground is, is, that's the place. Yeah. And this is, this is the Roger Perry, Simon Gregg era, where they were creating something just so awesome, man. Yeah. Because um, music was evolving. Like, yeah. So if, you know, nowadays, venues are very uh, genre specific. Okay. And there's always open format. They, they call it open format, that's the catch word yeah. in, in the new decade. This club, <laughs> Roger would play LL Cool J, I'm Bad, and then play Jack the Groove. So that's and, just fun for me. Like, oh my God, man. He, he could play anything. I remember one time, Roger played the DMC set that Chad Jackson or CJ McIntosh did at the DMCs because they printed it on the record, on DMC record. He played it in the club. The, the battle set, I was like, it was so, it was so cool. And I, and I, I did want to take this opportunity to give yes. Roger his flowers because he's the guy. Right. So Roger's that guy. Ro Roger's the guy that we would go, I mean, Simon had the records for sure. Yeah. And, and so did Roger. Yeah. But Simon had this constant stream of music coming in and then Roger would just play it. You know, we all aspired to be not as great as Roger, but to have the swagger that he had yes. when he was playing. I mean, if you talk to all of the people that I am close with, you know, I think if you talk to DLT, mm. you talk to um, Manuel, we always like, man, Sorry. I remember, I remember, vividly remember walking down into the playground and um, Fast Eddie, who's from Monaco, lives in Perth now, yeah. dancing on the dance floor. And he looked at me, and he looked at me as I came on the stairs, and he pointed to the DJ box. He's like, like you know, Roger, he's just technically brilliant. Yes, technically brilliant. But you know, anyway, this club was uh, a real. I know from speaking to Simon that he developed this place as a place for everyone to come to. Mm. So maybe they were a bit looser on the door policy than some other places. Right. But this place was full of everybody. That's correct. So all the beautiful people from High Street, the Cutter of Newton, all those people, Mike Hadu. Uh, and all the, you know, European rich people were all mixed in with those hood rats from Papakura, yeah. Monaco. We were all in the same venue, all dancing, having a great time. There was really no issues. Not really. There wasn't really many problems. Um, and it was a beautiful club. It was, if I was to liken it to a club that I've seen overseas, it looked a little bit like the Hacienda in Manchester, a little bit like industrialish. It had this huge playground words printed along the, the side of the the because it was multiple levels. Mm. There's a mezzanine you look down into, and then in the dance floor downstairs. But it, you know what, more than that, it was just a vibe, man. Yeah. It was, 
I wish I could transport myself back there. The right 80s now. were fun, you know. So I think this level here, that's the mezzanine level. Yes. Uh, on that, and then down the bottom where the bricks are down there. Yeah. I believe that was possibly where the secondary level was, but it's hard to tell because things have changed so much. I don't know if it was the first time that everyone had been in the same place at once. Yeah. But it felt like it. Yes. It really felt like it. I mean, sure it happened. And some of the other venues we're gonna we're gonna speak about, but I felt like mm. I felt like welcome. Yeah, you know what I mean. I feel like that area sounds like yeah. I mean, Grant said it in the last one as well. It was like clubbing at its infancy, because um, before that, back in the seventies, there wasn't turntables really, so um, or being mixed together with music. So this is when we actually got access to all kinds of music around the world mixed together in a club with a decent sound system. All yeah, in one I have place, to say yeah. the sound system. Yeah. And this place is banging, bro. Oh, great. I remember the first time I played in this club, so yeah. I got hired for a, um, a private party. Right. Me and my friend Ben got hired for a private party. Yeah. And I remember being in the DJ box and being terrified, man. <laughs> but no, no one was there. But I was like, I'm in Roger's DJ box. Wow. And I, I could, it was, it was really weird. I, it was almost surreal because Simon would be there handing Roger records. Yeah. Roger would be mixing to perfection. And here's my bum ass in there. And it was like his the aura of the joint was so heavy. Yeah. Uh, he made a mess of it. It was terrible. No, you probably did it great. <laughs> no, I don't think it was good. I don't You're freaking good. amazing. Man. So this is slightly actually different from the venue that I was talking about, which is which was down those stairs. Um, and so yeah, I used to go to um, the turnaround here. Yeah. And it was kind of like every in, the end of every month. It was like on a Thursday or something. Cayenne. Um, yeah. Cayenne. Samarina. And it was all that alternative music uh, from worldly music. You got like Latin music, funk, um, and that was quite cool. And that was sort of in this car park. The only yeah. turnaround I ever played at was yep. that was the one here. Oh, cool. It was one of the ones here. Yeah, it was, I... a, it was a nice space. Um, I've got another gig I went to down there, which was funny enough, Ed Rush and Optical. Just before drum and bass had really exploded, I went to a gig here, and there was probably 10, 20 people there. Um, <laughs> And we were just like, oh, what's this cool new music? And those guys were on the same bus, like, yeah, we're playing this new stuff, you know. And they'd probably be doing it for a year or two. And yeah, they were doing a little world tour, but honestly, drum and bass kicked off so quickly after that. Like, it was... It I think was, that's the beauty of venues like this one, Yeah. was that we, we were creating our own thing. Yes. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, it, it, we, I mean, sure, we, we'd heard about, because not we didn't have no internet back then. No. So even though you'd heard about these legendary clubs, maybe we thought this vibe that we were creating and, we, and when I say we were creating, we were the crowd. Mm. The, our, our, our job was to participate. Yeah. Simon was to get the venue, bring the music. Roger was to supply the music. And I, I don't mean to harp on about Roger, but I can't, you can't underestimate how much of an impact he had on everyone. I bet you've talked to people, they're like, mm. I remember seeing him play yeah. and just, and a lot of it was, he was just, it was, there was no flaws, eh? Yeah. So one of the things I was talking about in another episode was about Auckland as itself as is it known as a place that has a music nightlife culture yeah. that's that's talked about or, or renowned for. You could sort of argue both ways because you know some people think oh, you know Auckland da da da, but back in the 90s, the 80s, and, and into the 2000s a little bit, we actually had a lot of cool clubs and a lot of activity in the city, great DJs. So looking back, I think it actually was pretty cool. Yeah, well, it was cool, but I think what's equally as important was that the same thing was happening in other cities. So being who I am, I, I was lucky enough to travel a lot. Yes. I saw that happening everywhere. Okay. So it was like... It wasn't a, like we're on the forefront, but we were just definitely keeping up. Well, it was like everyone was moving at the same time, is maybe what I mean. Like, in Wellington, they had this really awesome, gritty... DLT mentioned it once, he goes, when we used to look at Wellington, we used to go, look at all the cool clothes they wear. And these like, we had to wear those clothes, we're going to die. <laughs> <laughs> so they had a nice fashion dynamic. The music was slightly different policy. Christchurch had another scene. I mean, that's where Greg came from. So we were all moving in the same direction. We just didn't even know it. Yes. But also being siloed, it forces you to create. Right. Do you know what I mean? Right. Maybe now that we're so connected, I don't say it's worse. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying when you're creating scenes like that, mm. it forces you to be creative because you, you're happy to be young and yeah. happy to be going out and having fun and creating music, etc. 
yeah. if Nets guy was in town, yeah, playing in Wellington, get on the plane. Back then, you ain't doing that shit. No, you wouldn't do that back then. You, you were really it focused. Wasn't on, as accessible, accessible. I can remember congregating in the Bretts on High Street, and there were everyone was there. You know, right. everyone was like, yeah, we're part of this scene, and we're not too cool. We were just wanted to be involved. Well, that was part of the adventure of going out with clubs. It's when you actually get to get to know other patrons or um, or the bouncer or the DJ. That was such a privilege, man. Back in those days, the scene was kind of smallish, and if you were out in Papakura doing your thing, yep. you came into town, you're like, oh shit, there's these like-minded individuals that are not in my town. Yep. So it was almost like discovering new friends and like-minded individuals, you know? The moment you've gone to a club enough times that you can walk up to the DJ and shake their hand or something, give them a little high five, whatever, that is a moment as a patron <laughs> that you've entered the realm of, I'm known here. <laughs> and, it's, and it's a cool thing, man, because back then it's a very nine to five kind of culture. You know, you work, you work on an hourly rate, and then, um, and then it's your escape, man, it's music. It's, it's this party and it's having a few drinks and just letting loose. And, and having a little community there is amazing. Then you've got the actual people that are working in there, the hospo people, and they have their own world where they're like nocturnal, drinking at the end of their shift, you know, staying up till like in early hours of the morning. Stuffies, they used to have stuffies. Stuffies, yeah. yeah afterwards. And that whole crew were just, they're hard working and really hearty, and <laughs> I don't know where their sleep came from. They don't even have any sleep, I don't think. You know, because all the people who worked on the bars never got a weekend to party, Tuesdays became a night. So there's a club that's underneath the Civic yeah. called Club Roma. It's pretty famous. Mark Phillips, Peter Ehrlich used to run that joint. Yeah. Uh, one of my first residencies I ever got was down there. Right, right. Um, and that was so the crowd would be made up of predominantly people who worked in other clubs. And that was real cool. And also we used to get heaps of celebrities that used to be in town on like a Tuesday night. They used to come there. So I remember tennis players and actors and all that sort of thing coming in there. Yeah. Actually, cool story about um, Roma. Roma was like my big break. Oh, okay. Um, what happened was I DJed at a 21st, Auckland City, and at that 21st was Mark Phillips and Peter oh. Ehrlich, and they came along and they said to me, and they liked the music I was playing, because at this point I was getting into the groove of playing club music, and they are like, oh, do you want to play at Roma? I was like, what? Wow. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so yeah. they took me down there, I did a set, and then about two months later I had a residency on a Tuesday night for the hospital crowd. What kind of music were you playing? Everything. Yeah. Hip-hop, house. We used to play heaps of hip-hop house music, but a little bit, a bit of both. Like, there's this real sweet spot, Rebel MC, Fast Eddie, all this oh, sort I of... I love Rebel MC. Yeah, yeah, all that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, that was that time, that was that moment. Now we're going to head down here, and there's another little place that was downstairs along Queen Street. Oh yeah, oh my um, god, that will, here we go. That I went to occasionally. I think it's Sterling Sports now. Ah, oh, that might be correct. Let's have a look. Another thing about club culture in Auckland as well was the bouncers. Yes. The bouncers became a really huge part of the actual culture. Not because they were stopping people coming in, but they were like friends, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, more than just regulating who comes in and out of the club, they were also like your protectors. Yeah. You would see them for dinner out somewhere, you know, they, they were real cool people. But all the good bouncers um, were, were never got in fights, all the really good ones, because they knew how to just talk to people and, and, and get, get to know people. Obviously there's going to be situations where they need to do something, but... Um, yeah, right there. Aha. No, no, that's I'm it, isn't it? I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I'm pretty sure now, because I know, I know because one time Friends of mine got into a fight, and I remember standing here, and the police were standing right there. Uh, so I, th I think so. Like, I mean, okay, we're talking about Fubark. We're just trying to confirm. Yeah. Before I played here, this is the place I wanted to play. Right. Yeah. So I was playing around town, whatever, but I wanted to play at this. So it was they're playing electronic drum and bass. Really kicked off in this building, um, but then. Gareth started doing these gigs called Foo's Your Daddy. So the Foo's Your Daddy flyer alone was a was a moment. Mm. Like they'd all dress up in like pimp gear. Yeah. And I, I just thought it was real cool, but they'd done a few and I was like, I really want to be in that gig, but I'm really not one to ask. I just never have been. 
Yeah. And I just like, please, one day. And then I got the call up. And this was my first introduction to the Fast Crew. So recently I did a, um, a video series. <laughs> hey, bro. <laughs> hey, Hank. Hey, come here, come here. <laughs> Sammy Jack, you doing your um, shoe? How's it all going, mate, Sammy? Good, brother. Good, how are you doing? Yeah, Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, it's all good, man. <laughs> <laughs> been telling me you've been doing your... Oh, no, this is uh, for this is old club gigs and stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is okay, Sammy, brother. amazing singer, as, as you know. <laughs> okay, thank you, brother. Mm. Who's your daddy? And this is my first introduction to the Fast Crew, and I did a video series about them recently, and people were surprised that I was a big fan. I was like... What? <laughs> how, how do you not be a fan of these fucking people? They're yeah. awesome, man. Yeah, they blew up, old Dane. And, yeah. But that literally came out of here. So, fun story about food bars. I remember going down here doing Food's Your Daddy and the Fast Crew were playing, and I was like, who the Fast Crew? I don't really know. Get down there, and I'm playing the set after them, and they perform, and I'm looking in the crowd, and it's packed, wall to wall packed, and all the people are singing the worst of the songs. I'm like, how do they know the yeah. words of the songs? That's when you know you've made it as a New Zealand artist, by the way, is when the crowd is singing the lyrics. Um, Scribe mentioned that when he was playing The Big Day Out. There weren't many other hip-hop artists coming out where everyone was singing the lyrics line for sure. line the whole way through. A time when you know you've made it. So, so FUBA on so many levels was amazing. I mean, I remember seeing every notable drum and bass DJ that's played down here. I remember LTJ Bookham played down here to a packed house, they had an extra night, he was in town, he played a free gig, and the bar side, so there's, there was two sides to the club, there's the main room on the right, and to the left there was a bar, and then Bookham just turned up down there and started playing, and then we got around and then the place was packed, I think it was a Sunday, yep. maybe even a weird Monday night or something or other, but it's pretty legendary that Bookham was mm. just one of the biggest in the world at that time, doing a free gig down at the food bar, and that's the... That's the true link between artists and this place and Gareth in particular. Yeah. It's just like, you go out of your way for real great promoters like yep. him. Um, but this venue was amazing. Again, it was a melting pot of people. If you tell me who went down there, everyone went down there. I felt it was more of the alternative to everything else. So you've got, you know, you've got your mainstream music, you've got your house, sort of heavy electro stuff. Here it was sort of mixed with maybe hip hop, drum and bass and some electronica. Yeah, and I think that was intentional. I think that yeah. Gareth was like, uh, and his team, I shouldn't just talk about Gareth, but yeah. they were like, we want to be something a bit different. Yeah. And that was always this thing. Look at Northern Bass. It's like, right. I mean, uh, clearly it's a bass festival, but he's always looking to be an, an, uh, an alternative offering to what everyone else has, has, has got. So yeah. uh, this, this place is huge for me. Mm. Like, I did my early major flavors um, parties I did down here. I did the, uh, Aotearoa Hip Hop Summit after party down here yeah. when literally every single artist hip hop artist in Aotearoa was all in the house it was crazy right. I did um, and sorry it's not just about me but everyone was there uh, we did the uh, the drum and bass hip hop battles down here Yeah. so it was me and P Money versus Concord Dawn Jeez. Yeah. down here that would have been that was <laughs> and it actually got a bit Jumpy, we got, it was a bit titchy. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, I remember because um, Evan got on the mic. Oh, Matt got on the mic, I can't yeah. remember. And then I remember s swapping the mic off and going, you know, you know you're nervous or in trouble when you're on the mic and you're one of these mother... <laughs> like, right. And, and it was like, ha ha, oh, that wasn't funny. <laughs> uh, so there was that. The G unit after party was down here. Wow, cool. Yeah, so I, that was, that was the first yeah. time I met DJ Green Lantern, one of the greatest mixtape DJs of all time. Played in here with him. There's a photo of me and him down here. Me considerably younger. Um, and the whole of the G unit were here. Except for 50 wasn't here. Lloyd Banks, Tony Yayo, everyone was in the house. That's one thing that, that um, Foo did really well was after parties. Yeah, yeah. They did it really well because it was a good space. And that comes down to looking after the, the artists. You know? They ain't coming here if, if you're not going to look after them. Yeah. Um, not that you have to pamper to them, but it's also got to be comfortable, you know? Yeah. Should we have a quick look? See what's down there. See what happens. I hope we're in the right place. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it did split off into two venues, so you had... Yeah, see, theoretically there would be yep. a door right there. The, the door girl's booth was here. Yeah. I don't know. Hi. Yeah. No, this, this, is, the, this is the layout of our It makes sense. I hope we're not wrong. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. It's correct us if we're wrong. Yeah. This used to be FUBAR. Um, so this was the longer room. 
There's a little dance floor right here. Just right there is a dance floor, right. a little tiny well, one. Well, still got the podium. <laughs> <laughs> well, not right now, we're on the corner of High Street and Shorten Street. Underneath the pavement here, yep. and underneath this historic building, is a club. And what was the actual first name of this? I mean... I actually don't know. We Okay, can you guys write down what the first club that was down says? And, um, oh, there's the door there. Yeah, this is the door. Yeah. We know it as code. Yeah. Well, and various other things too. Yeah, uh, it's now currently the mothership, right? Yes, it is. Yeah. Yep. And it's, uh, it might be run by the Raglan people, isn't it? Not sure. Ah, hey. <laughs> hey, mate. Hey, we're doing a little historic tour of um, clubs in Auckland. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I used to come here every Wednesday for about two years when Grant was doing retro on the Wednesday. Yeah, we did was fun, Thursdays man. and it was fucking, my God. Yeah. yeah that's probably the... Hey! hey. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. How are you, bro? Good, man? Hey, I'm hey, Shane, man. How's it? Yeah. Nice to meet hey, you, bro. Hey, how are you, bro? Oh, my man. What a joint. So, yeah, moved the boat from over there. The last time you would have played here, I guess. Yeah, over there now. Oh. Built the stage here. Oh, wow. That's so, when it was code, the booth was down there. It was, yep. The last time I played here would have been when it was over there. The parlour moved it there. Yep. And now it's, uh, we've got a stage for like, live stuff. And when I played here at Code, it was over there. But oh, it was, so yeah, they did the yeah. Change, right? yes. So it went back and forth. Yeah, it went. It was there, and then it was there, and then it was there, and now it's over there. So you've been the like this area here. It was communal toilets for a bit there, wasn't oh, it? So remember the, the smoking area. So Alfie's used to be out this other door. Yep. Alfie's was next door. Right? Yeah. So this was the smoking area that Alfie's used. Wow, and Alfie's so, is going way back. Yep. Dan, Dan Tippett did all the art for us out here, all um, Parliament theme. So there's a big George. Holy shit, this is cool. Yeah. This is an awesome alleyway. Oh my god. The Bootsy. Wow, this is sick. Look at, look at that. Yeah, you so, better remember that for your music video, yeah, shoes, yeah. man. I actually know about so, this alleyway. It's, it's oh, yeah. one of the better ones, this yeah. Was the, um, the Bootsy, Bootsy, Collins. Bootsy Collins. Oh, Bootsy Collins, there you go. <laughs> So sorry, you say that Alfie's was through that door? Yeah, so that song was held by the landlord. So that used to be come through the smoking area here. Um, so what, Dahlia used to own that, eh? Okay. She did? Yeah, I think so. Dahlia is the other part of the FUBA. Oh, yeah, right, yeah, right, yeah. Right. So Alfie's was known as the, as the club that underage could get into. Anyone, <laughs> anyone could get in Alfie's. Yeah, yet. yeah, yeah. And they had a drag show every night that was amazing too, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I had friends at school that were going to Alfie's. Um, I didn't use my fake ID here, but I used it in some other places, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. His career driver. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is currently now Mothership. This is Mothership, yeah. And what do you guys play here, or is it mixed? Uh, yeah, it's across the board, so uh, dance music at some stage, uh, live bands, yeah, across yeah. the board. When, when I was here, Tom Sampson, who was part of the playground management team. They got me in because I don't think Thursdays was really work, was really happening. We decided to do, this is when I was on TV, on the radio a lot, so mm. like there was a bit Things of- Things are really working it, for it was, There's a lot of momentum and then this became my longest running residency ever. Wow. It was a hip hop and R&B night. It was me and this guy called Peter James. Peter James isn't a really around in the scene anymore, but at, let me tell you something about me as a DJ, is that I always would DJ with people who are way better than me. It happened constantly throughout my career. I was DJing with this guy called Ben Tiariki from Mount Eden in a, in a hip hop band. He was always way better than me. I was playing with Manuel. Manuel was like, Manuel's better than most people. And then I was, then I was playing with Ali from Christchurch who was at, with Shan, we were a team. Ali was way better than I. Then I was DJing with Peter James and he was just like, this dude's selection skills were on another level. The way he used to do his drops kind of influenced the way I play now. Yeah, so we're in right. 2023 now. The way I played now is a little bit influenced by playing with him down here. I think we had like a three to four year run, maybe. Wow. Maybe it was, and when I say run, it was heaving. Yeah. Couldn't get in the door. We're at capacity all the time. You could still smoke in the room. Yeah, yeah, I remember those days. <laughs> so we would come home from this, this place in particular. It stank. stank of smoke. <laughs> I remember Savage coming here a lot. Yeah. He would stand over in that area over there. The DJ box was quite big. It was quite big and wide. Yep. It was over there. So we would, um, yeah, everyone came here. It, it was like, looking back on it now, it was like what Playground had. Yep. It was kind of, it became that. But Thursdays was, was a real thing because people knew 
they could stay up till three or four, go to work on Friday and just bear with it. And it, yeah. was, and it was the weekend. It, I'll be honest, it was quite a brown crowd in here mm. because of the music style we were playing. And by yep. then there'd been a bit of separation of the scenes within the club. Mm. But this, this was, you know, had multiple memories in all these clubs about the residency at Roma and mm. Fubar times. But this is probably the time I remember the most fondly because real, it was real fun, man. Yeah. It was real fun. Yeah. I remember playing in this room <laughs> I remember playing Closer by Neo in this room. Yeah. Play the club. I mean, I played it and I was like, damn, this song is good. Two weeks later, it was the biggest song in the world. Damn. And the cl- and could you play it again? And I played it again. And, was, and, I, and I literally standing in the DJ box yelling at people, why didn't you dance for this two right. weeks ago? <laughs> Isn't it? Because well, you've, got, you've got hip hop, right? And then you've got the mainstream. But hip hop became mainstream yeah. in a way. So, yeah. Like, like, mixed I, with I remember Irreplaceable yeah. by. Yeah. Beyonce being huge here. Yeah, yeah. When, we, when it first came out, me and Pete got it, we played it, and straight away it was like, wow, this is going to be massive. Well, yeah. we didn't predict it, but you could just feel it. Yeah. That was the music that was playing around this time. Yo, Excuse Me was by Chris Brown was huge in this club. Yeah. The, Shout or, out Peter James, actually. Um, yeah. Where are you? I haven't seen you in a while, but you're a cool dude, man. Like, and, and this club, yeah. this was his club. I mean, right. I, I was the semi-famous one, but yeah. he was the guy. Yeah. Like, I, I know people that would literally just turn up I went when Pete on, I was like, damn, say, say to me. Yeah. Uh, but he because he had uh, really awesome selection skills. Right. Inc- incredible, in fact. But we were living together as well. Ah, oh, okay. So we were living in St. Luke's together. So we would constantly be thinking about Thursday. Yeah, what awesome. are we going to do on Thursday? How good, good is it going to be? But again, a huge part of it was Tom and his vision for this venue. Mm, mm. And look at it now. It's this incredible, beautiful. When I used to go to Retro Wednesday, the, the DJ booth was up here and it was actually kind of closed off a bit. It was kind of a small, like they had was pillars here. Um, it, it actually came out a bit further and it was rounded. Yeah, okay. Um, but people were always trying to get in there. That was definitely the um, era of people trying to get in the DJ box. <laughs> They've seen, uh, for sure. I remember that. I mean, personally, I like a place where you can access the DJ. Um, because the, if, if you can access the DJ, that's fun. But as long as the punters aren't going to disrupt the DJ? That's the point. It's, it depends on like who's in the building. They always you know? do. What are you talking about? Yeah, that's funny. You probably hate that stuff. No, no, no. It's fine. But, it's you, cool. but you look at like, um, what do they call it? The boiler room. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, yeah, that's different though. It's a different thing. But, but, but they that, know they're being filmed. They know they're being filmed. But also, they know that there's kind of rules around it. Yeah. yeah except yeah. for that guy that reached over and was <laughs> <laughs> the stop. Yeah. So I think, you know, what this new incarnation of what code has become, Mothership, yeah. This is like, this is legit, you know, this is long term awesomeness. So when it, when it got, when Co became huge, mm. they opened both floors. So we were yeah. in one high upstairs and down here. Yeah. But almost that was kind of the breaking point. Mm. And but another important part of this is that Asta opened. So uh-huh. we're at the bottom of High Street mm. and Asta was at the top of High Street, which used to be Base Bar, which used to be Vodabar. Bar. Yeah. And what happened was, and this is a real important part of what happened in that time, mm. was when. 09 started playing at Asta. Whatever he was doing down there was really working. I think a large part of it was his selection is exceptional. Like yeah. from a soul R and B point. Yeah. And that was a really nice because we were playing like club bangers, you know, big hits, but yep. 09 was playing really beautifully curated mm. playlists for a long period of time. And then the the crowd eventually started to drift up the road. Yeah. So, and as with all venues, they have their lifespan. Yeah. And so at some point you know, 09 had taken that Thursday mantle and then everyone was started going, out. and so the point I, I started going, <laughs> yeah, right, I was right. like, man, it's cool, it's fun up there, Etsy and Psalms were on the door, it was real Etsy. fun, yeah. so we would just go up there. He was like Peter James, people would go to see what he would play, Yeah, yeah. you know, like uh, album tracks, mm. um, interesting things like new music that no one else was really thinking about, mm-hmm. and I think that's what made him unique, and that's why mm. Esther eventually became the spot in code, Yeah, sort of dwindled off, yeah. Okay, pretty exciting. We're coming to a place where there was a few venues. Well, it's the same venue, but it changed names, changed owners. Yep. This was one entrance to it here. Yep. Do any of you guys know what it is? Well, it's a goodie. Yeah. For me, it was Boogie Wonderland. Yep. Previously was Shakers, I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong. Boogie Wonderland was focused on 70s disco music. Yes. Um, we had DJ Nigel Love. This is where the dance floor was actually illuminated, like the um, Saturday Night Fever. Yep. And it had really cool booze that you could come in and you'd, you could spend the whole night here, get to 2 a.m. There was a bit more of an older crowd um, because of the, the genre of music. Yep. 
Um, but it was good times, man. I always had good nights down here. But it's actually still running as a different place. So we'll go around the corner. Side entrance to the same venue, I believe. Yes, that is. And this is, this is where I am actually a resident now. I'm once a month, I'm playing at Kong. And the reason for that is it's always about who you're working with, huh? Yeah. Um, so Dan, the guy who's the manager, Loretta, the owner, pretty cool people. Um, but the way that the city now, we're talking about 2023, has evolved, is um, this has become a spot. Yeah. Like, it really is the spot. It's pretty safe now. Mm. It's, a very, it's a huge part, you know, in our new age of being safe. Mm. And it's been the spot for about six, seven years? Or? It kind of, I'll be honest, it kind of fell off for a little bit. Right, but right. In the last two years, no, they, no, they won't be here. <laughs> what? In the last couple of years, it's just, now it's the spot. Yeah. So I'm um, due to play here in, in two weekends. Yeah. And it's just, the line goes all the way. People always talk about the line. It usually goes around some McDonald's. You can stand in line and eat McDonald's while you're waiting. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's got nice booths. Maybe that's something that's held it together a little bit as well, having a McDonald's around the corner. Because uh, maybe. I'm just not, I'm, I'm saying I'm not just in the club. I'm no, saying not the McDonald's is kind of handy. Yeah, no, it's pretty cool. It's got good people. Yeah. Um, the roster of DJs here now is really good. Jordan Lee kind of made his name here. Love Jordan Lee. Yeah. The guy's so he, very talented. And, and check out his YouTube as well if you're looking for some uh, DJ tips. You know, I think that Jordan is probably the guy most people talk about now. Mm. Like, because he's extremely skilled, puts a lot of time and work into his um, sets. Mm. But he made him, his name, his name came through Baccio as well, of course, when he was momentous and all those days. But here is kind of where he cemented himself and yeah. the way his career went. But now, this is the place. It's a, it is a hip hop and R&B club. You don't wander too far outside the constraints of that. But yeah, I had my birthday here oh, a couple of months ago. It was great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and also, I think also being down this part of town is pretty important. Like it's down by the waterfront. Mm. This you area. You're walking street as well. Yeah, and like this was blocked off for a long time. Now it's open. The train station's right there. I talked about it before about catching buses. Now people kick around here for a couple of hours, catch the train home. Yeah. <laughs> okay, moving on to the viaduct now, and there's this giant big venue here, and it's at the back end of the Hilton, which they tried to make it look like a kind of cruise ship, but it's got a lot of this kind of scaffolding looking kind of vibe on it, so I never really liked the look of it, but yeah. Anyway, huge club that used to be here, and um, went for a few names. We know it as sort of Float, yep. and went to the Sanctuary, had another name prior to this, I think think comments please yeah run in the comments because it's just vanished from my mind anyway lots um, of people not as float yeah let's go have a look inside well it's got a roof now the, the, the used yeah. to be two levels this is the bottom level and no there's there three levels i think can't remember maybe <laughs> um dance floor was over there yes and it was on a different tier it was a little bit lower there was a step down and also there was um, bleachers you could sit on at the back wall mm. and there was the dance floor but also people were dancing throughout the venue as well yeah. so it was right through it. Later on in the era of this club, um, yeah, Linium took it over yes. and he actually did pretty well with it. Um, it's a big room. Yeah, it's a big room to fill. This is a big challenge, this club, because was, this is probably the biggest club in New Zealand, really. I couldn't, I can't really think of something bigger. Like, yeah, maybe. Yeah, I mean like, yeah, I'd come in here and he, he would get on the mic. Well, he actually, his brother was on the mic. Uh, and he'd be like, yeah, we've got Jay Sterling in the building. Come out with like, all these shots and stuff. I was like, whoa, what do you got going on here, man? It's amazing. <laughs> but yeah, totally changed now. Now it's a restaurant. Yep. A restaurant, yeah. So, And what's the name of this restaurant? Morocana. Morocana, yeah. So. It's Moroccan facilities. Wow, Moroccan food. Mm. The DJ box was flying. So, so the, the DJ box was above us. But it was it was flying. Is so it you were, hanging? It was it was it was it was permanent structure, but it was kind of hanging. Yeah. So you would be on the. I don't I didn't really like it. Yeah. So you're on the top level, on the next level up, and you would step down. Yeah. Into this flying DJ box. Wow. That was always, and I'm not good with heights, <laughs> so I was always a bit like, oh. Yeah. But I, I do remember vividly, yeah. um, playing on New Year's here, one of the biggest gigs. One of the biggest gigs in this city that I've ever done on this sort of level. Wow. Not wow. like festival or, you know, like large scale gigs. Mm. It was run by Sample G, Grant Cooney. Wow. So Grant used to run um, R&B Super Club here. Right. It was a genius move on his part. Mm. Um, quite ambitious. But I remember on a New Year's Eve, I, I stayed here 
Without going to go into details, this is probably one of the biggest checks I ever got for a DJ set. Wow. In my career. And that was 11 to 12 p.m. Or was oh, it I was, I can't, I can't remember. Yeah. But I just remember it because it was a big party. Yeah. I mean, it was lines out the door, ticket price was pretty hefty. Yeah. I, I even remember thinking, wow, that, that, that's a lot. And Grant's like, no, nah, it's going to be fine. And he was totally right. Oh, good um, the, the venue was absolutely heaving. Mm. It was packed. Um, and also the, the, the idea of where this club is is cool because like the harbour's right there, the boats are coming and going. They weren't coming at night, clearly. Yeah. But it was just a real cool spot. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so he, he was a little bit of a visionary in that sense. I mean, he'd already done his brain parties brain. and all that sort of thing. But um, to be in this, you know, people go, what's your favourite gig? I'm not saying it's one of my favourite gigs, but I remember it. Yeah. Out of all the gigs, I totally remember that night. Yeah. And it, this place was completely packed with people. And so New Year's Eve, I mean, I mean did you do the drop? The, the midnight? I, I, I can't remember. I can't, I can't remember. <laughs> hey, thanks, man. Cheers. Hey, thank you, bro. Pleasure, bro. Thank you, man. Hey, bro. Hey, how, how, you? how are you? You've had a pretty amazing career. Um, you've, got, you've gotten onto a lot of gigs of, of big, big name artists. Mm -hmm. um, I'm pretty lucky. Yeah. I've seen <laughs> a lot of the photos on Instagram of you with. <laughs> Like you know, Kim Kardashian. Um, t tell me, what was how did how did that come to part? Like obviously being DJing in Auckland, making a name for yourself. Where does it go from like opening for these big acts? And is, is that just something that gets established over the years? It's like you become the go-to party crowd pleaser that's going to be able to open for these big acts. Or Do you know what? It's like I believe it's thirty percent um, skill. And 70% don't be a dickhead. Because <laughs> you know what? When you are uh, DJing to 10,000 people and you're backstage with international artists with troops of security and stuff, the last thing that they want is someone who's going to be annoying. So it's that reliability of, like, yeah, you're not going to uh, fan fanboy. Yeah, it's 70% of it is the relationship, that, uh, the relationship and what you're going to be. Like, for instance... The, probably the biggest opening set I've ever done would be Eminem. Wow. At Westpac Stadium. Jesus. Yeah, that was that was the biggest crowd I've ever personally played to. I think that was like, it was upwards of 30,000 people, I think. Um, and would you play like in between other opening acts as well? Yes. Because the DJ usually fills in those spots, yep. right? So I, I played before the first opening act and then in between the ones after that. And then that when Eminem was about to go on, they, they basically stripped the backstage of any human being right. that's not supposed to be there, right. including you, even the label bosses, everyone's got to get out. Wow. So when you're in that sort of position, the last thing you want, or the last thing the promoter or the tour manager or the main artist wants is people are annoying. Um, so, you know, I pride myself on being pretty um, well behaved mm. backstage. You know, some people get into that situation and you know, they have a rioter and they end up drinking a bottle of Hennessy and next thing they're being a pain in the ass. And I, I just not that guy. Not, beside the fact that I don't really drink anymore. Um, but the, the, I know that they can rely on me, you know. And I know, I know that Market Live Nation will go, oh, you know, Phil's going to open for but such and such. He's just not going to be annoying. <laughs> 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 um, and, of course, then and then the other part of it is just knowing what's playing. Reading a crowd, yeah. Yeah, like, you know, I've, I don't know. I've, I'm, so many people have done, um, you know, I think I did Missy Elliott. But in that sense, you know, another part of it is like, you're not the main act, man. So just play your role. You know yeah. what I mean? Like people are there. Like just this, we're in 2023 now. You know, the the era of Aussie draw rappers is here. Mm. Um, I play for Young and Lips and Kitty Kitty Doll Hamilton to like over 1,700 people. Wow. But they're not there to see me. They're there to see him. Mm. So it's kind of like playing your role, like, Quite often DJs are, are, are showboaters, you know, they get on stage and they, you know, and, and you know, you want to create a good atmosphere, but you, you, you're warming up. You're warming the up time. the show for that guy, bro. Yeah. So yeah. it's kind of like, you know, and, and that role, you know, I played my role. But I mean, I have been to some gigs where the DJ in between the acts, it's been amazing. And sometimes more fun than the act. Yeah, it can, it can be like that sometimes. It can be like that sometimes, but that's not by design. You no, know? it just happens. That's because yeah. the main act's shit. It often comes down to how how much they turn you up as well, because that's a thing. They often, you know, will keep the, the acts really loud and the and the, and the DJ you, you, in between. Usually, your festivals is fifty percent. Fifty. Yeah. Okay. 
but it, uh, uh, yeah, just the ones that have been good, they've had them up real loud. And, and just by, I don't know if it's an accident or the sound guy. It would be an accident, I would say. <laughs> Usually, like, I know that at Eminem, I was mandated with playing it 60% of yeah, okay. the, um, and then the, the support acts were like around 70 something. Yeah, okay. Um, I do know that sometimes that fill in DJ spot can be pretty fun. Like, um, I've done Rhythm and Vines main stage a couple of times. Wow, yeah. And because of the range of acts that are on stage, what you offer is actually pretty awesome. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, there could be anyone from, I mean, one of the years I played Playboy Cardi, played on that stage, but then also Leisure played. So, you know, it, it ranged from shoegaze bands to turned up trap rappers. So it's kind of like, and then Ed Rush was on, on last that year. Um, so it can be a real journey. And then me and my MC call it the palate cleanser. We're the palate cleanser. Like, mm -hmm. you know, you, 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 the, the act you plays. The coffee beans at the. Um... Yeah, we just <laughs> wipe the slate clean and start again. But I would always reflect the band that's playing next year. I'm not going to play, you know. One of their songs. <laughs> yeah, no, you never do that. <laughs> that was, There's good. some hideous stories about it. Oh, man. In, in, in Tamaki for sure. I can tell you what my favorite DJ gig of all time is. Yeah. I know exactly what that is. It's um, Rhythm and Vines. Wow. Uh, pre COVID. Uh, in between COVID? Uh, pre COVID. Mm. Um, I played. It's quite recent. It is recent, and um, it is my favorite set of all time. There's a couple of reasons. First was the crowd was live. As, I was playing on the Heineken stage. Crowd was insane. Wow. I had rehearsed that set. Oh, okay. So many. That's what I was going to ask you because some DJs really methodically get every track and, and even rehearse it. Yeah. Well, I, usually when I play, I don't. I have these like clusters wing of song. I just wing it and see what happens. Bring it, everything. You get them all organized. Or you, or you yeah, I have like little clusters of like 10 songs and I'll go, oh, I'm going to play that one. So I'll play stuff around it, add in some new songs or whatever. But for that day, I was video DJing. So mm -hmm. the whole stage is one massive video screen. I had, <laughs> I think my, I've got an MC that I literally can't live without anymore, uh, Rome's. He was with me and we, I'm pretty sure he got sick of me. Because we hired out the Serato Studios for the days preceding the event, and I went over that set. Oh my God, so many times! Wow. Plus, it was an hour and a half set. It was quite normally the, the sets there an hour. So it was like I a went, performance, you know. This is a yeah, it was, and it was like you can't really wing it when you're using video as well. So I rehearsed it over and over and over and over and over, and then by the time I got on stage, I was just like, I'm, I'm good. Wow. And then you know we kind of the set played out exactly how I wanted it to play. There was some people there um, that told me that it sounded and looked amazing, wow. who were not fanboys of me. Like they're not my, they're not going to tell me it was good when it sucked. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's when you know you're doing something um, good. I remember vividly front row, looking down, and Israel Adesanya was in the front row. He came up on stage, and he he had, he just won, you know, the world title. That was pretty cool. Um, you know, one of my favorite New Zealand MCs, Vane, had played before me. She was around. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. Chuch and AP came out on my set. Oh, so it was like the full circle moment where everything yeah. went just right. You wow. know what I mean? The sweet spot. It must be like you shooting a video. Like, the weather's great. The lighting's cool. Everything came yeah. full circle. I, I felt like I played pretty well that day. So, yeah, that R&V set will go down as my favorite. I actually said, after I finished, I said to Rome's, if this is it, I'm good. I literally, we, we talked about it afterwards. I said, if I don't ever DJ again, I'm good. Yep. But here I am, I'm still here. <laughs> um, if you get, any of you guys watching, if we're at that set, please comment. Um, it'd be great to hear from you. Yeah, that was a good one. That was a goodie. <laughs> okay, we're still in the city, but we've moved uptown and coming up to a venue that's been here for a long time. Yep. And it's still running. Yeah, but you guessed it. Currently, the power station. Now originally, it wasn't the power station. This was actually a hotel lobby built back in the 1960s. Um, I did not know that. Yeah. Now, um, what was the name of the hotel? It's write out in the comments if you know that. Later on, it became a, um, a venue for music. Yep. Galaxy is its name. We'll see if anyone's home. Wow, you are here. Hello, oh, how are hey, you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, currently, something going on there that we're not allowed to go into, but that's fine. Now, the power station has been a host to hundreds, thousands of gigs for a long time. Um, but yeah, previously called Galaxy. I think it was Asylum first. 
in, in, in clubland. Yeah, no, well, I, I've just read a few different things online. One has said Asylum was within Galaxy. Oh, really? Yeah, but uh, you guys correct us, but um, okay. Asylum was a, a, a club that had a diverse crowd in Auckland where people of all shapes, sizes, colours, whatever, could come into and have a good night. I don't really know much because yep. I came here when it was Galaxy. Right. So Galaxy, well, it was, this is the hardest door to get in, by the way. So... You know, I talk to Manuel about it all the time. We talk about this place. This is a very famous moment where Manuel laid eyes on Roger Perry, and that's where the Roger Perry influence really kicked in. That was here. Right. Um, but getting in the door was hard because the doormen that are from here are from South Auckland. So you would, we would turn up here, and they were like, "What are you doing here?" Yeah, yeah. So I think Manuel would had to try multiple times to get in here. Eventually, got in here, but the DJ box was on this end yes and Manuel was right behind him staring over looking down onto his DJ setup now I spoke to Roger about this and Roger said he was a bit worried because there's all these South Aucklanders like watching what staring doing. over him and stuff and stuff and he was looking up like what's going on well, what was Manuel, he was, about? Manuel was trying to read the labels on the records uh, right. to figure out what the songs were an old DJ trick was to actually cover them up they were was it what, do you ever do that uh, no um, but this was like, this was the kickoff for all those other clubs, like, you know. Uh, and, and by the way, I don't know if that is actually how it happened, but that's how it looked for us. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, went from here, six-month club was in town, and then the Brat and Playground happened. And for us, it was like a uh, sequential succession mm. of clubs. But this is kind of the first one I went into before Playground, where I was aware of dance music, meaning multi-genre music and a big, big venue. Because you have to remember, at this point I've been to Manhattan or The Forge, but this place had a big sound system. Yeah. So songs that we heard, they sounded completely different in here. This is maybe one of the most important places for our careers. I did a 12 hour dance party here once. 12 hours? 12 hour dance, 10 till 10. It was how me the and this hell guy. How did you get through it? Would you eat halfway? <laughs> no, we were young men. Yeah, you just got energy. Yeah, you get drunk and get sober and then keep yeah. going. Mm -hmm. But then, like later in my career, probably, you know, apart from the M&M support slot, the big ones I've done are in here. Yeah. So I opened for Kendrick Lamar before wow. he really kicked off. We are talking about selfies before, you know, getting selfies. And, you know, back early in our days, we were kind of humble guys and we wouldn't go get the selfie with the with the performer or the artist, whatever, because we, you know, we, don't, we didn't want to be that guy. And looking back, we should have got that photo. Yeah, man. Why not? Well, I was standing on the, on the floor, looking at the stage, ch chatting away to him, and I was like, get a photo, get a photo, get a photo, get a photo. Yeah. I was like, oh, nah. And then I remember when I'd finished my set and Kendrick was about to go on, I thought, oh, I'll pluck up the courage, and I walked out there, <laughs> and it's like, no photos. Oh. <laughs> it wasn't me, it was the security. Yeah. But also for Snoop Dogg here. Wow. I was, yeah, it was here, um, Nas. Soundgarden, Marilyn Manson. I mean, the first time I ever met Chuck D in person was here. Yeah, so yeah. me and DLT turned up to the sound check because we could. Right. Walked in and we were at the bar and we sat there, stood there talking to Chuck D for a while. That night, very important moment that night, not important, but a great moment was when I'd been kicking around with Joan Lomu quite a bit right. and his cousin, Sire, and we brought Jonah in and Jonah met Public Enemy so there's a really great oh, photo cool, of Jonah and Chuck D together on the left side of the stage um, lots of great moments lots of bands as well yeah. right they play there I mean that's what we get when we have an actual purpose built venue okay it's got soundproofing so it's not going to disturb like this re there's probably some residents nearby and the capacity is around a thousand I believe you've got two levels two bars and to this day we're still running I mean, there was a period where this actually turned into a retro nightclub for a year. Didn't quite work out, unfortunately. Um, but now we're back to what it should be doing, and it's holding gigs. As you can see, a whole roster of gigs here. Mitch James. One of my first gigs I ever went to when I was like oh, 16, drunk, went to The Brain, uh, yeah. which was Grant Kearney's um, gig. And from then on, I went to every single Brain that was here. Yeah, and, so and that's the beauty of the venue of, of The Brain is that we'd gone from going, oh, let's go see, because the first gig I ever went to here was New Order. New Order played here, wow. when it was, but it was New, New Order at the Galaxy. Yeah. That's when it wasn't called the Power Station. So that's, mm. well, I was very, very young. I came here and I saw New Order play, and then 
you know, they're playing stadiums now. But um, the beauty of doing a 12-hour dance party, Grant doing the brain here, is that it, it went from, here's a big act playing, you know, to a weather acts, and we'll take the door, and I'll play my records. It's like a lovely little economy that you're creating a community of people that come to gigs. That's why I think that venues like this are so important. Yeah. Um, also expensive to run, I believe, you know, like, yeah. It can't be cheap, the rent here must be horrendous. I, I would say that, like you, lots of people go, oh, my first gig I Something or other, yeah, yeah. It's probably here, yeah, yeah, love it. Well guys, that concludes our Lost Nightclub tour. Remember to subscribe to the channel. Definitely. Um, I've also got some other travel videos on this channel. Uh, and also I'm doing a $100 bar, uh, bar tab giveaway. Write in a comment anything to do with any of these venues we've mentioned, uh, and I'll give you a $100 bar tab for the best comment. Um, like and, and you've also got to like and subscribe the post. But um, thank you so much, Philip Bell, DJ Severe. You're a legend, and you're, you're honestly a legend that's that's still here and still active. And yeah, we really appreciate your time today. Awesome. And thank you. Let's reach <laughs> out here and connect. Yummy. Um, thank you so much, brother. Good